So cool. Thanks for being here, everybody. Going to talk a bit about coordination game design. So this is based on some concepts from a book called The Art of Game Design, a book of lenses by Jesse Schell that breaks down what is a game, how ought a game designer go about designing a game, what does it mean to design a game, gets into the, the formal definition of a game. And when I read this book, it's amazing to me how much of the content, how many of the concepts about game design transfer to DAO design, that we're essentially designing a game for to play, uh, for DAO members to play. Um, and as we get in the definition of of a game, you'll kind of see the parallel there. So my assertion here is that if you're in a DAO, you're simultaneously a designer and a player. So if you can get clear on when you're des when you're designing and when you're playing, like those are two different modes. Um, I think it creates a little bit more clarity in what's going on in the DAO. So like a lot of times, the conversations that we think we're we think we're playing the game, we're trying to make a decision or whatever. We're really kind of arguing about the design of the game, how things ought to be done. But if you can settle on a design, imperfect as it may, and agree to play, then you can play the game and then get some play test data and go back and design. So, so like just iterating between those two modes, I think is a really helpful distinction. So you you alternate between game design and game play. So, what is the formal definition of a game? Uh, a simple one from the book is that a game is just a problem-solving activity. But if that were true, then math problems would be games. You know, maybe they could be um, if you approach them with a playful attitude. So next definition, a game is a problem-solving activity approached with a playful attitude. I think this works pretty well. You know, like children in particular can make a game out of almost anything. Um, but this problem-solving activity hides a lot of complexity. So let's go a little bit further and see if we can get more specific. And Greg Kostikian has our backs. A game is an interactive structure of endogenous meaning that requires players to struggle toward a goal. So endogenous meaning basically means internal to the game. It has meaning in the game the example is monopoly like the monopoly money has meaning in the monopoly game but when the game is over you can't take it to the bank and deposit it the, the meaning of that money the value of it is endogenous so we see endogenous value in DAOs with things like shares and badges and so like really paying attention to what has endogenous meaning if you have to go exogenous then your game might not be as compelling as it need, as it could be. So if a token translates to money on the outside, maybe it has some endogenous meaning while it's inside the game, but you're mostly anchoring exogenous, you know, external values. So an example of a game that's not very fun if it's not anchored on exogenous is roulette. Nobody plays roulette unless there's money on the table, right? It, re it requires that kind of pulling from the external value system for that game to be fun. Otherwise, it's basically just flipping a coin. Um, so really paying attention to what the endogenous meaning in your DAO is. Uh, we'll get more into that in a second. Um, introducing this concept of infinite versus finite games. So games have a, a nested nature. So the idea of an, an infinite game is it's the one that goes on and on and on. And the point of the infinite game is to continue to play. And then the infinite game is composed of finite games. So when you're designing a finite game, just keep in mind that you're, this finite game is probably inside of another finite game. So I think with DAOs, your DAO is a finite game, but it's also inside of, like you might say, the Web3 game or the Ethereum game. And that's part of a larger game, that's our economic system, and that's part of a larger game, that's the universe, and eventually you get to the infinite game uh, that that goes on. So so while you're in these these finite games, keeping some perspective, re remembering that on the outer le 
as you zoom further out, the point is to continue to play. So you don't want to play a finite game in a way that prevents the possibility of future games. The example I give is basketball. Uh, I like to play basketball, and I might be able to win one particular basketball game by playing dirty. You know, I might step under someone's foot and have them roll their ankle, but eventually people aren't going to want to play with me anymore, and I kind of break the infinite game if I favor the finite game too strongly. This is a book, Infinite versus Finite Games, that I, I recommend. It's a pretty quick read, but has a lot of mind-blowing concepts in there. And, of course, we know Moloch, the god of co coordination failure, this invisible force that often pre prevents us from working together toward meaningful aims. This is, I put this in here because he's the source of conflict. When we, when we talk about conflict in games, um, I think that Moloch and lore concepts that we see popping up in DAO is kind of a way to um, create the notion of conflict. What are we fighting against? Um, what is the struggle? We can conjure Moloch. So when you design a game that gets results and that people want to play, that's entered willfully, you have defeated Moloch for now. Okay, so how do you, how do you apply this? to your DAO. So you can ask, does your DAO got game? Is your game interactive? Is it a problem-solving activity? Does it have endogenous meaning? Are the players struggling toward a goal? And are they approaching with a playful attitude? So we're going to, each of these colored portions is, has its own slides. So we're going to look at those parts and ask some questions about how it applies to DAOs. Um, and then the assertion that a good game is all of this, but also fun. So you can have all of this, but it doesn't necessarily have to be fun, even if you approach with the playful attitude. But if you design a good game, it should be fun too. Okay, so interactive structure. Players active, not passive. I th what comes to mind is all the war camp meetings where people are just kind of silent. <laughs> um, having a way for people to, to interact in a structure is a good sign. Uh, the player and the game interact with one another, and the structure is defined by rules that allow the interaction. So most of us are war camp folks here. Um, I'm wondering if anybody could give an example, or or Rome, if, if you have an example from a DAO you've participated in any DAO, was an example of a structure defined by rules that allows interaction. We've got some in the Moloch contracts for sure. I was trying to remember what I said yesterday, but I think it was with the coordinate that we do. Mm -hmm. uh, staking shares. Right, that the shares are... That's a good example because it's... it's um, it's an off-chain thing, right? So it's like purely in the rule set where we've just agreed that the coordinate shares that you get are going to translate into shares in Moloch. It's kind of a, a rule set that we play with. And that gives, that gives a mode of interaction, right? Like people do that interaction repeatedly. So that's a good one. Um, struggle toward a goal. So struggle implies challenge and conflict. That's where Moloch comes in um, a lot of times. But toward a goal means there's a way to win. And toward implies winning is not guaranteed. So what might be our, our goal that we're struggling toward in Dow House? So onboarding people to Dow's? Mm -hmm. So if we had a goal to onboard some people, um, or I guess it's build DAO tooling. Right. So, so the way that this is useful, you know, like setting goals, like you've heard that a million times, but when we're designing a game, you need a clearly defined goal. So, so that that goal, you know, like build DAO tooling is kind of vague. When we were on fire for releasing V3, I think the reason that but the reason that was going well, or that we were working well, was because we were struggling toward a goal. And that's the case because struggling toward a goal is an important part of a game. It felt like, a, it, 
like we had some structure that we had some meaning in what we're doing so if there isn't a clearly set goal your game might be falling apart playful attitude um did we have a playful attitude or do we have a playful attitude in Dow House? when we talk about bringing good vibes you know yeah absolutely yeah I, I would agree and I guess that just cut like a little bit of meta the reason that these are useful is that you can look at each one and if there's a problem in your DAO you just look at each one and be like which part of the game have we forgotten you know like have we forgotten the playful attitude part did we forget to have a clearly defined goal that we struggled to? You know, is is there an interactive structure based on rules? Each one of these are like levers that you can pull to tune your DAO. Um, you know, using the spirit of a game to do so. Okay, so endogenous value. So let's say in DAO house, what is where do we have endogenous value? Like, what's valuable to the players of the game? Um, well, I guess, like, in that instance, right, like, building Dow House V3 is valuable to the players. So maybe code check-ins? Oh, of, okay, yeah. Right. Like that kind of thing could be valuable to the players of the game. Um, okay, yeah. So like check-ins, mm -hmm. feedback loop, right, from other people we're working with, collaboration. Yeah, uh, there might be like an invisible reputation system that you know you're accruing reputation endogenous. That's an endogenous value in the DAO. Um, the shares, right? Like the shares in the Moloch DAO have endogenous value. They're really only good for passing proposals um, and making decisions inside the DAO. Uh, Jordan and I had a hack session on a DAO that we're designing after we talked about this yesterday. And this question right here is like, how can I make it more valuable to them? I think is one of the best levers for that you can pull to improve your DAO. So like Rowdy, in the case of check-ins, GitHub check-ins, um, you know, or lines of code written or something, if we were to ask, how could it make it more valuable to you to do that? Um, like if I wanted to, I'm kind of asking like, how could I incentivize GitHub code check-ins? How could I make you want those things? Um, so like some ideas might be creating a badge or or having some kind of, I don't know, like extra shares or something, you know, like giving you other forms of endogenous value to make one form more valuable. Can you guys see how that's a pretty awesome question to ask that if you made some changes in your DAO could improve how everything operates? Absolutely. And then, uh, right, and then it kind of gets to this question. What's the relationship between value in the game and the player's motivations? Right, so, like, in uh, Monopoly, people will get, like, really freaking motivated to get that land, to get money, right? Like, emotional and irrational uh, because the exogenous value mechanism was created so well. So I think this one has a lot, a lot of potential, like all the reputation systems and NFTs and badges. This is really why so much attention is going there because of that endogenous value aspect. And then ultimately a game is a problem solving activity. And I think that this is the core intersection between DAO and game. You know, like clearly with the DAO, you know, or a company or organization, any human endeavor, we're very often trying to solve some problem. Um, same with a game. So I think that's why so many of the game design principles align when you're designing a DAO. So with a problem, when you're doing problem solving, state the problem, define a clear goal. 
with Tao manifestos and purpose statements and such, I think that you're kind of playing in this realm. Um, what is the problem? Frame the problem, determine its boundaries. What is the problem? What is not the problem? And then what methods are we allowed to use to solve the problem? And I think this, this gets into the part about rules and creating a formal structure for your game. Because if you can be clear in your DAO what methods are allowed, or like basically how we're going to go about it, think about a good board game. You sit down and you pretty quickly understand the problem that you're trying to solve. You know, maybe win, get the most points, whatever. But you can't just do anything. You can't pull a gun and be like, give me all the Monopoly money. You have a finite set of actions that are kind of okay to take. And so if you get clear on what those are, uh, structure sort of breeds creativity. So when you're designing a DAO or when you're trying to improve your DAO, a asking this question, like, what methods are we allowed to solve or use to solve the problem? It kind of constrains people's choices a bit, and that helps with problem solving. And this... This is a quote from the book, and I think it, it really sums up what all of this is getting at. And it's that our minds are equipped to set up an internal, minimized, simplified version of reality that only includes the necessary interrelationships needed to solve the problem. So think about that. All the complexity of reality, and we have this ability to have a minimized, simplified version of it, that only includes the necessary interrelationships needed to solve the problem. It's a cleaner, smaller version of the real world situation which we can more easily consider and manipulate or interact with. When we're designing a game, that's what we're doing. You're taking some complex metaphor and giving a constrained set of um, methods to interact with the complex metaphor, like Settlers of Catan or um, you know, any kind of world building game. And if you can do that with your DAO, where, okay, we have this complex world out there, this big problem that we're trying to solve, but we're going to build a minimized, simplified version of reality and kind of have these like levers that we can pull. And if we design them well, when we pull the levers and do the things, we end up having a big impact on the external reality. It's like building a cockpit and with a few buttons and levers and when you pull them you have a bigger impact than if you were trying to manipulate every atom in the universe individually. And then here's the cheat sheet running down this list when you're trying to solve a DAO related problem and just checking uh, are all of these things true about your DAO where they entered willfully. Uh, this is different than willingly, you know? So if I airdrop you some tokens and you're like, okay, that's fine. That's different than willfully, you know, like having them take an active action to do things. Again, clearly defined goals. Conflict. Um, I think Moloch is a stand in here, you know, like, oh, we're having conflict with Moloch. But there's always going to be some conflict, even if it's with you know, like your continuous integration system or trying to get your code to work <laughs> properly, uh, but accounting for it, making sure that it has it and accounting for it through your rules, identifying your win and lose scenario, uh, defining the modes of interaction, making sure that people are in engaged. It's down here. And uh, that they're challenging, that they have their endogenous value and they're closed formal systems. The closed formal systems, I think smart contracts are so appealing because a smart contract is the definition of a closed formal system, has very clearly defined rules. That's why we like when a particular problem translates into smart contracts because it's right here. Um, but not everything has to be a smart contract. You can define closed formal systems for board games, for instance. Um, but you can define those for your DAO as well. Like the coordinate system is a closed formal system. Each month this happens, people have this input and this output, and it translates in this way. 
you can follow the state chart all the way through. Uh, so yeah, thinking about what what explicitly defined closed formal systems does your DAO have um, is a good vector for tuning the thing. You know, it's kind of like tuning an engine, and these are some of the principles underneath it all. Uh, but yeah, that's it. That's the that's the idea that I wanted to get across. Curious if anybody has any thoughts or insights based on that. Um, ways that you might be able to make changes in your own DAO or design better using some of these. Good day. Yeah, thank you, UI. Um, I liked it so much. I I came to both sessions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's cool. So I was wondering too, Sorry. like on that last slide, you said like you either win or lose games. But do you think it's really more just like the game ends and is either not necessarily like a, I don't know, I guess win or lose? I was, do you win or you didn't? <laughs> well, but like the outcome of it, you know, um, was either a success. Or not yeah you're not well, really like a loser right you still played and you tried yeah something like well having time i guess these are game design principles right so like when you're designing a game um being clear on what the win condition is and what the lose condition is if you're playing a game that doesn't have a clear win or lose condition it you know it might be fun it might seem like a game but something is going to feel like it's missing uh, gotcha these are kind of like shortcuts to help you put your finger on the thing that might be missing you know it's like man this game's really fun but something's missing you can just run down that list and be like, oh there's no way to win <laughs> maybe winning is also you know trying for a, a you know your best for a guaranteed amount of time right like right. you don't have to look exactly at the outcome but like this amount of like really hard work i'm going to push myself to this level um and you know i'm, I'm going to do that that's it, winning this is that that could be the goal or win state of the game as opposed to the desired outcome right like a high score mechanism kind of thing yeah that makes sense <clears throat> and if there's no way to lose then it can feel like there's nothing at risk you know so getting explicit about those things and remember we're also kind of designing the thing while we play it. I don't know if you've ever played have you played Dungeons and Dragons? Yeah, it's been a while though. But you've got the game master there, right? And the game master is kind of you know the game master might be able to set a <laughs> set a deadline or set a quest and be like you have to get the sword and rescue the princess before the dragon gets to the city, right? But if the players like have the sword and they've almost rescued the princess, the, the game master might not make them lose immediately, even though they set the win condi or the, the lose condition as the dragon gets to the city. You know, they might extend the deadline, so to speak, right? Like so long as the game is engaging and interactive and people are solving the problem at hand, because remember it's a problem solving activity. So the game in that case the game master can kinda tweak the rules just a little bit to keep the game going and i think in a DAO, like with a board game you said the, the, there's not a game master you know the rules are there you play you lose it's over you know it's kind of a machine that you're running with the DAO, you you're you're oscillating between this design and playing thing so you're building a machine to play but you also have to remember like we're trying to solve a problem here so you might be like well this isn't really serving us quite right or the wing you know we're, we might lose the game so how about we pop out and change the rules a little bit so that we have a chance yeah it, it, and it's like balancing those things like putting on your design hat and your play hat and going back and forth to make sure that you're engaging and problem solving the whole time but it's a delicate balance but somewhere in there is a just like the tuning mechanism to get the DAO really humming. Yeah, that makes sense. That's cool. I I definitely could see like value from yeah what we were just going through. 
like you said, like racing against the clock, kind of right. Right. Had an element, <laughs> which was time. Yeah. Always, always wanna. Um, and I feel like yeah, we could have done more in terms of like badging or celebrating like small wins or like you know like beating a level or something like that right right yeah if you've been thinking with that lens of endogenous value some of those might have come up i think that what's helpful with a model like this is it you know it seems to be adding complexity like oh here's all these things you have to think about but it gives you kind of a simplified view of the whole thing. Um, you know, my time in Dow space, it just feels it's like I can intuitively sense a lot of these things and be like, oh, we need some of this and we need some of that. But it's hard to say why I think that. And I really feel like this game design model helps you get specific about why exactly does it not feel like it's working. So my hope here is to turn this into kind of a, like a tuning checklist. It's like, if if your DAO isn't providing endogenous value, well, heck, make that happen, you know? And then we can go, like, does your DAO have a clear win state and lose state? No? Okay, let's go make that happen. I, I think if you check all these things off the checklist, eventually you're going to be in a badass DAO. <laughs>